can change the world. If you want to be successful in Africa, you need to find someone who's been there and done that and has a passion for it. We've got all of that today with Nduri Chuku from Mission Africa. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, I am, I'm really excited about this because, um, well, when I go to the website, missionafrica.us, uh, and we're going to have that up on the screen several times, you say this, and so let's just get right into it, if that's okay with you, Andudi. Um, opening doors of cultural exchange and obtaining resources to assist underprivileged children and families. Okay, that's an awful lot. What does that mean? It means that Mission Africa offers people the opportunity to travel to Africa on shorter mission just to experience life in a different culture. That is one part of that. The second part is um, we believe in looking for resources. When we come here to the United States, we're looking for greener pastures and we're looking for ways to find resources to help the people we left behind. So Mission Africa, it's kind of a funnel, you know, that um, lets those resources flow from the United States to the villages of Africa. You know, I got to ask you this. It's a that's a beautiful dress and uh, an attire. Is that from your home country? It is from my home country. Yeah, and that home you. country is. It's Nigeria. I'm from the Igbo tribe of Nigeria. Igbo. Igbo. I B O. Oh, I B O tribe mm -hmm. of Nigeria. And where? What part of Nigeria? It's in the southeast. Southeast. Yes. Is does that attire have a specific name? Um, no, this is what we wear every day. It's just the different fabrics that have the different names. Hmm. <laughs> but getting back to obtaining resources to assist uh, underprivileged children and families, what is it, what do they need? Oh, a lot. You know, the needs there are monumental. That is why it's not something one organization like Mission Africa can tackle. We need, you know, a village to help these villages. Hmm. So, that, you know, we have um, most of this poor people we help in the villages, they don't have the basic an amenities, they don't have fresh water, some of them don't have electricity, some of them don't have uh, medical centers located close to where they live, and some of them don't have, you know, quality education for their children. So these are the people that Mission Africa aims to empower. Mm -hmm. They need a whole lot. So yes, exactly. You talk about this as well on the website. Michigan Africa may aims to empower children and families in the remote villages of Nigeria, Tanzania, Uganda, and Kenya by providing support in the three core areas of education, health care, and poverty alleviation. So before we get into those specific areas, why the remote villages? Don't most of the people live in the cities? Uh, no, everybody who lives in the village, in the city, actually has a village. Uh, most people who live in the villages are people who have retired from the cities or people who are poor that they cannot keep up with, with the bills of the city. So a lot of people who don't leave the village at all are people who are not educated or who don't have the opportunity to leave the village. So those are the people that Mission Africa want to serve. And um, the first, our first 50 students that were awarded Mission Africa scholarships were from my village. And my village is Azarewelu, Emekuku, in Imo State of Nigeria. I'm sure you can't say those names. No, I, I can't. <laughs> so we had But those, you're going to uh, teach me though, right? <laughs> I will try. <laughs> so we have those 50 students uh, graduate. All of them graduated in 2013. And we picked up another 50. We just take one, you know, 50 at a time. Mm. And the 50 we have now are from my husband's village, Amogwetem, and uh, Ovim in Abia State, because our governor in Imo State kind of declared free education. So we just moved to the next state, which is my husband's state. And the reason why we pick these villages is because we have trusted relations who can help us monitor, you know, the progress of these kids, who can help us mm -hmm. with our programs there. We work very closely with the kings of the village and the leadership, you know, the traditional rulers there. So wow, it is easy for us to work with the villagers where we know people. Well, you, you have said a lot there. First <laughs> off, uh, you said uh, the, the governor of the state where your husband comes from, he declared free education. Does, does that mean that 
in other places they don't have free public education? Yes, actually it's the uh, governor of the state where I come from, the oh. Imo state of Nigeria. So um, yes, I, I think, I might be wrong, but I think that's the only state that has declared uh, free education out of the 36 states of Nigeria. So that is why we decided to go to my husband's state and help the next batch of 50 students. Hmm. How much, when, when you give a, a scholarship, how much is it? It costs about $300 a year to you know, provide the school fees. We pay three times a year, we run in terms, and uh, we provide school uniforms, we provide school supplies, and we provide books for these mm -hmm. kids. Yeah. Uh, how can you make sure that they're staying in school and they're doing well? Because we walk directly. Before we do anything in any village, we, we do a little bit of advocacy. We pay homage to the king of the village. We you know, um, recognize the leadership of that village. So we work very closely with the people who know these kids. My husband and I you know, and my son, we live here. So we need to work with the villagers themselves because they will tell you this two people are poor, but this one is poorer than the other person. Or this child has been out of school for so long. So please, if you can start with this. When we want to recruit 50 students, we might get, you know, 500 applications, I'm not kidding you. So mm. it takes working with the people from that particular village to know who to pick and who to choose. So we do not do anything without working closely with the leadership. You know, they, they know what their people want. They advocate for their people. They want the best for the, you know, the people of their mm. communities. That, that sounds pretty, <clears throat> pretty tough though if you have to, to tell 90% of the students who are wanting an education that you can't pay for it. Well, uh, Mission Africa is, uh, we're building friends, we're building partnerships. We are believing that in no, you know, in, in a short time we'll be able to give more than 50. But when we started the scholarship program in 2008, one of the things we decided is we, we will not, we cannot afford to bite more than we can chew. We want to make sure that those kids are provided for, um, if it means keeping it at 50 for now. But we are hoping that we'll be able to increase that number very soon. You also talked about you work with the kings of the villages. I, I've heard of chiefs, um, and I've heard of kings typically tied to Western Europe. But I've not heard of kings there. What am I missing? Um, we call them kings because we, they have a lot of chiefs under them, you know, under their rulership, mm -hmm. you can get a chieftaincy title if you um, maybe bring fresh water to my village, or maybe you bring um, electricity to my village, you know, or maybe you give scholarships. You can get a chieftaincy title. It's, it's their way of showing appreciation, mm -hmm. but it doesn't make you the, the ruler of that particular tribe or that particular village or that particular clan. Sometimes it's by election, sometimes it's by um, coming from the royal family. So every culture has a different way of doing it. So we try, sometimes it, it's kind of insulting to call a, a, a king a chief because there are so many other chiefs from that particular village. Mm. Yes. So, so I, I guess you really do have to know the, what's, <laughs> that, what's happening at the local. That's community. right. <laughs> so um, how do you stay in touch? I mean. You live thousands of miles away. We travel to um, Nigeria uh, quite often. My husband just came back from a trip, you know, um, on Friday. So we also communicate with the people there. We have trusted volunteers who help us do the work. We also partner with um, local organizations there. You know, when we do our programs, we have to have on the ground organizations that we work with because they know how to do these programs. Most of the time what we do is fund these programs and then show up. But we have trusted volunteers who will go from one village school to another paying our school fees who will show up and recruit more volunteers for us when we do our free medical outreaches in different remote villages. Well, we're going to be getting to all, to all of those things, but, uh, but another way that you communicate is through technology, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, is it is it true that regardless of the, even the most remote villages, they still have cell phones? Oh, yeah. I, you know, grandmothers who cannot speak English, they, they talk on the phone, which is wonderful. You know, it used to be that having a telephone uh, in your house was just for the rich and wealthy. But now it, it's just a, a blessing to be able to communicate with your people. 
uh, no matter where they are. We started out the show with an introduction of you saying that you are a person who knows what you're doing. So how do you and Duty Chuku, uh, how do you know what you're doing? <laughs> I just, I just uh, recently became a full-time um, uh, executive director of Mission Africa, but prior to that, until the 21st of January, you know, um, 2014, I worked at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, there, I was just exposed to the to the passion and the mission of that great foundation. The mission is to provide, give people the opportunity to live a healthy and productive life. And that is the mission that drives us every day. It was just exciting to know that you are helping change the lives of millions of people all over the world just by showing up you know, at work. It doesn't matter what you do, whether you're typing an email or whether you're making a phone call or whether you're receiving a guest to the foundation. Just the fact that you're part of that foundation means that you are helping give people all over the world that um, that uh, opportunity you know that help them make a difference in their lives so being there helped prepare me you know to tackle this next phase of my life and there we were able to build very strong partnerships and very strong um, support from the uh, colleagues. As an employee of the Gates Foundation, one of the things that we had as a benefit is the three to one match. Uh, it means that any employee is entitled to $10,000 each year and any organization that you donate to, the foundation matches it by three. Wow. And so you, people have no idea how far $40,000 can go in the villages of Africa. So we are doing so much. When I say we, I mean the Dilla Melinda Gates Foundation, they are doing so much all over the world. And most of them are being captured on the database. But the things that we do through the money that comes from the matching fund might never be captured. But millions of people are being helped because we have, you know, over, over a thousand employees and um, they are donating to different organizations and they are changing lives. You know, while I was there we were able my colleagues and the support I had there we were able to offer all these uh, education scholarships we were able to do these uh, free medical outreaches at some point I did a glasses drive you know because we did a free medical outreach with these focus. kinds of glasses that's right with mm -hmm. a main focus to eyesight so we were able to get a lot of glasses and we were able to provide over 500 pair, pairs of glasses to uh, the villagers and it changed their lives forever. Wow. So those are the things that, you know, prepares you and makes you keep thinking, I want to do this full time. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we've talked a little bit about uh, what you do in education. Uh, we, let's talk about health care and poverty alleviation now for, with Mission Africa. And by the way, again, we're going to be putting the website up on the screen <laughs> several times throughout the show. Um, it seems to me that education, health care, and poverty alleviation all works together. Mm -hmm. um, how, I mean, but those are huge things. They are. How can you provide for all three of those? Well, the thing is, we, uh, we just believe that you, you just do what you can. Our, our motto is one village at a time. So I'd rather help people from one village than wait until I can help the entire country. You know, so that, that's what we do. We do free medical outreaches. Like I said before, we fund these uh, programs through local organizations. So they come in, it's set up like a hospital. They come in, they register, you know, they see a general practitioner, they find out what they want. If they need you know, to see an eye doctor, they'll send them to where the eye doctor, you know, is, or if they need to see somebody to test their blood sugar and things like that. So, and people are very appreciative because normally people don't go to the hospital. We don't have personal physicians. We don't have yearly checkup. Most times people don't go to the hospital. They are carried to the hospital because they, were, they are sick. They are so sick that relations have to take them to the hospital. You're already carrying water. You yeah. are, now you're carrying people to the doctor <laughs> as well? Because they don't have uh, um, um, medical centers or hospitals uh, 
that are very close to where they live. Um, actually, uh, last year, 2013, Mission Africa was able to acquire a piece of land. And we chose that particular piece of land because it's located between two local government areas. They, uh, and it's made up of a cluster of 18 villages. Um, we have in those two local government areas, one it's about, has about 185 people in them, the other 1,000 in them, the other one 145,000 people in them. Mm -hmm. And uh, they don't have a medical center or hospital located you know, within 10 miles of their homes. Mm. So literally people die on their way to the hospital because oh they gosh. can't get to the hospital fast enough. So that is why Mission Africa chose that particular location because we are looking for partners to help us build a modern hospital there so to serve these 350, you know, mm. plus yeah. people. You, we've talked mostly about Nigeria, but you work in other countries too, Tanzania, Uganda, and mm -hmm. Kenya, at least for now, and, and maybe others down the road. Uh, is your theory of your work in the other countries the same as it is Nigeria? Um, kind of. Actually, that's what makes Mission Africa unique, because the passion to work in these countries comes from the citizens of that country. My husband and I, like I said, are originally from Nigeria. So we have the passion to help our people. The people we're reaching, the people, the lives we're impacting, they are not numbers. They are people that we know. They are our people. You know, we speak the language. We understand the culture. We know the geographical area. So we know where these needs are critical. So for Tanzania, we have Emil and Regina Kapinga, who are citizens of uh, Tanzania. And they are managing, they, they incorporated Mission Africa Tanzania, and they are managing our work there. We're in uh, Uganda, we have Dr. Elizabeth Lule, you know, who is from Uganda. And and we all chose not to forget the people that w we left behind when we came mm. to this to the states. In Kenya, we have Simeon and Mercy Karanja. You know, they are citizens of Kenya, and uh, we all want to make sure that we we help, even if it's one child at a time or one village at a time. So a lot of people say, why this village? Why this country? Why not in this country? We want, you know, Africans who are here, you know, to be able to join forces and be able to help our people because you hear it over and over again when you leave to come to the States. They tell you don't forget us. Don't forget us. And it's a choice you have to make. You know, we choose not to forget. So that is why we work and the connection with all these people who manage Mission Africa in, in these different countries is we all work together at the Villa Mille that Gates Foundation. In fact, the others are still there and the one that left so that we can focus on doing more for our people. And Mission Africa provides the oversight for all these countries and uh, we act as a fiscal sponsor. As a fiscal sponsor? Yes. So, uh, you, you basically, so that, what does that mean exactly, a fiscal sponsor in this uh, instance? It, it means that um, uh, the Karanjas, the Kapingas, you know, Dr. Lule, they were all experts in their different fields and they were employed or recruited by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation as experts in what they do. So they are here on their working visa and they, are, they cannot incorporate a 501c3 organization. But they are also entitled to the $10,000 which when it's matched becomes $40,000. Mm. So and most of them, most adult Africans run to families because you have to send money to the kids in the village if you have it you have to send we live an extended family relation you know a system mm -hmm. you have to send money anyway to people in your village who cannot go to school you have to send money to people in your village who are you know who are sick uncles and aunts cousins nieces nephews so they're already doing this work and most of them have already uh, an NGO that is mm -hmm. registered in their in their name in their country forgive me for asking this but why isn't public education free? <laughs> I wish I can. I can answer that question, but I don't know. Uh, most African countries don't have any, free, any level of free education. Your parents start paying from the time you get into school. So sometimes you have kids that, you know, or you have students that are as old as 25, 26, they're still struggling to finish high school because you go when your parents can't send you. And, and if they can't afford it, then, then you as a child don't get to go to school, and so then the cycle of poverty just That's becomes right. worse and worse and That's worse. That's right. That's why are, why are 
people poor there? Well, like you said, when people don't have the opportunity, because that's all we're giving them. We're giving them opportunity to come out of generational poverty. When you have an education, um, my parents were, were, were not rich people. We were not poor either. If we were poor, I didn't notice. But they did their best to make sure that all of us had you know, good education. And we are so grateful for that. So when people don't have the basic education, they, you know, they don't have any means of stepping out of that poverty at all. Mm. You've been working uh, with Mission Africa for some time, and then your, your past work with uh, the Gates Foundation. I bet you have some success stories, don't you? <laughs> I have. Quite Tell us a bit. about some of the people that uh, you, you and your team have positively helped. Well, um, like I said, last year our free medical outreach was focused on eyesight. We gave out you know, over a little bit over 500 um, pairs of glasses. It changed the lives of these villagers forever. It was it was wonderful. Um, last year we were also able to purchase the piece of land that I talked about and we're mm -hmm. looking forward to building a modern hospital on that piece of land and maybe a school too for Mission Africa. Mm -hmm. um, also we uh, in 2011 we were able because we ship books to Africa um, in 40 foot container loads we were able to equip a library of a school a high school and because of that they qualified to be accredited for the nation's um, high school diploma exam yeah. so that was huge it changed the course of their you know their history forever but uh, coming to the kids that we serve um, we have one named Joy Joy comes from a polygamous home and in a polygamous home sometimes when the wife is not the preferred wife the children will not be the preferred children don't ask me how that works but it happens so um, Joy's mom was not the preferred wife so for Joy and her other siblings to go through high school and finish you know it was a very slim chance but when she got the Mission Africa scholarship she finished high school. She's a, great, a graduate now and she has a bright future. We have another one, her name is Jean. Uh, her parents died when she was very, very little and she was left with a, in a single, um, single young lady as her aunt to take care of her. So for her to go to school or finish was a slim chance and um, Mission Africa offered her scholarship. Now she's a graduate and uh, she is in nursing school. Hmm. And we have another one, her name is Testimony. Testimony is that died of HIV AIDS. The mom had cancer and went blind completely. And uh, after five months after the mom died. So Testimony is an 11 year old. The, she's um, the second child of five. Her older sister was 14 at the time and she was a primary caregiver for the rest of the family. Mm -hmm. So they, they had no hope of going to school. Somebody recommended testimony and she is currently one of our you know, students and she's doing well. In healthcare, you know, we have been able to send people straight to the hospital because just testing their blood sugar or testing their blood pressure, you find out that they are so sick that they might just drop dead or have a stroke without even knowing it. And because we don't have regular medical checkups, people don't know. They don't know what's going on. So we have made a tremendous impact on the lives of these villagers and yeah. we are very thankful for that. And you know, I got to ask you this too, because I asked you about your success stories and we don't, right here on, uh, we don't call them um, failures. We call them success stories yet to be. So do you have some of those too? <laughs> yes, I have some of those. Like I keep saying over and over, we are looking forward to building a, a hospital. Mm -hmm. It is very, very close to our heart. We're very passionate about it because it just is not acceptable for kids to die um, from preventable diseases. We have to have a place where they can go and get their immunization. Um, early detection of cancer is not supposed to be something just for the rich and wealthy. It should be something that people have access to. Mission Africa Hospital will be able to give people medical treatment without 
waiting for them to register first or pay first because that is how it works over there and sometimes people literally die at the reception of the hospital because they are not able to pay you know the registration mm -hmm. fees so there's so many things that we're passionate about but we are really looking forward to this um, building this hospital and we need partners another one is the school um, all of our students go to public schools and uh, we make sure they have everything they need to go to school and finish but we have no control over what they are learning we have no control over the quality of education they are getting some of them they go through schools with us having benches to sit on some of them don't have you know plumbing in their schools some of them don't have roof on their schools but at least with mission africa scholarship they go through school and they graduate when we have our own school at least we can monitor that we will make sure that you know people are exposed both the haves and the have nots are exposed to the same level of quality education that's you know one of the things that we need another thing is we want to be able to track the progress of our of our students we want to be able to build a robust you know data system but what do you do if um, if a family needs the the child to be home working uh, to prov help provide food for the family instead of go to school and you've already given him a scholarship what do you do you, you say to the family sorry that in order to keep the scholarship he's got to go to school well uh, the people that we help are already eager these children are eager to learn Mm -hmm. The only reason why they are not in school is because their parents cannot afford to send them to school due to no um, free education. So we have hundreds of applications just to recruit 50. So the mm -hmm. ones that we get, and we work very closely with the leadership of the village, they tell us this one needs it more, this one needs it more. That is how we do our screening and we pick these kids. So we have never encountered kids who we are forcing to go to school or giving scholarship. What happens is when they get these scholarships, they work extra hard to make sure that they deserve it. We get a copy of their report cards every time. Mm -hmm. We only have about a minute and a half left. Okay. Um, but the, the main thing that I wanted to ask you is that five years from now, if you were to, to look back, what do, you, what do you expect for Mission Africa U.S.? Well, I expect uh, Mission Africa U.S. to have built enough friends and partnerships, you know, to make sure that the things that we are passionate about and the programs we're running, you know, are going on. I will, you know, uh, see in five years we, we must have an up and running uh, hospital in Nigeria and probably in some other of the countries where we serve we want to have an up and running Mission Africa High School you know we want to have like I said solid partnerships we want to be able to work with the government of the of the countries where we serve and we want to be able to attract professionals, medical professionals, educators to go with us and see how they can help us. We want to do that on a consistent basis. Actually, we have a team that will be going you know, on a short mission trip in April of this year. We do that every year. So, but in five years from now, we will have systems set up you know, that will be able to grow Mission Africa. We want to attract other Africans who want to help their people you know, to join the Mission Africa family. Well, right here, we're looking forward to tracking that with you. Uh, Ndudi, thank you very much for being with us. That's been Ndudi Chuku from Mission Africa. If you have questions or if you want to help, go to the website and you'll learn how. Take care. Rainmaker believes we can change the world. Live to inspire and to be inspired.